Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement coming up on today's show. It's FA Cup third round weekend, but what does the world's oldest cup competition stand for anymore? Maybe the sparks will fly at Anfield this afternoon. Jurgen Klopp and Carlo Ancelotti, they go head-to-head -head in the Merseyside derby. And Tottenham, they play Middlesbrough today. It's Christian Eriksen about to sign an agreement to join Inter Milan next summer. Under contract this morning, Jason Burt is Chief Football Correspondent at the Daily Telegraph. Darren Lewis is all things to all men. Football writer, columnist, spokesman, media star, Sean the Daily Mirror. And Dominic King is a Northern Football Correspondent for the Daily Mail. Thanks very much uh, for joining us this morning. I know you've got a big game uh, to watch a little bit later on as well, haven't you, at, uh, at Anfield. It is, of course, Liverpool against Everton. Don't forget, you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on your screen over the next 90 minutes. OK, part one this morning, this is where we're going to start. We've got a bit of a beer in our bonnet about the FA Cup. It's lost its sparkle. Uh, Dean Smith, beaten manager yesterday, Aston Villa losing at uh, Fulham in the FA Cup third round. He says it's lost. It's magic. They were beaten by that Harry Outer goal yesterday at Craven Cottage. But where were the fans at that game yesterday? Big game for them against Aston Villa to see Scott Parker's side win. Good result here, though, for Tranmere. 3-0 down at Watford, taking the Mickey. Mickey Mellon's side uh, drawing 3-3 for that replay. Take them back to replay at Prenton Park. Uh, good story here as well for Rochdale, 40-year-old uh, Aaron Wilbrahimovic. Great story. Uh, getting equaliser yesterday against uh, Newcastle. Jason got the joke as well. That's what I like. <laughs> the others didn't, unfortunately. Uh, the observer, though, uh, Jonathan Liu, uh, took himself of it as you would, or as Jonathan would, regular guest on this programme, of course, um, would take himself off to St Andrews for the big game, Birmingham um, against Blackburn. Whether you can see that picture or not, this is the Tilton Road stand at uh, St Andrews, but there's just nobody in it, uh, which is a sad reflection of FA Cup third round weekend. Back of the sun, January, um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and his Manchester United side. They drew nil-nil at Wolves last night. Uh, they'll now face, they'll now play eight games in uh, 20 Five days. They've got an action-packed uh, January uh, fixture schedule. Back of the Sunday people. Harry Pratt here says the claws are out for Moyes. Uh, his contract, despite 18, running to 18 months, that West Ham can still um, get rid of him at the end of the season. Uh, Steve Bates with a big story here. On any other day, I think it would be a back-page lead. Uh, Lingard and £45 million pounds, uh, for James Madison. Could that really happen? Lingard, of course, uh, had a loan spell, a short loan spell at Leicester City. Uh, an Everton expert, thankfully, on the table. Reeling. Everton left reeling by record losses. Tom Morgan um, with the story on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph <coughs> this morning. The losses are because they keep on sacking their managers. They'll hope they don't have to do that with Carlo Ancelotti. Uh, Jonathan Northcroft, uh, head of today's Merseyside derby. Um, who would you rather play for? Um, two di very, very different managerial styles, but two super successful coaches, Jurgen Klopp, and Everton's new man, Carlo Ancelotti. We're going to get <coughs> on to that in part two of today's programme. Let's start, though, with the FA Cup. It is, some people would say, Jason, this is our annual assault on uh, the FA Cup. Um, the, uh, how did you reflect on FA Cup third round weekend? I think it's the first third round that I've never written a feature for in advance. And uh, telling in itself, I just didn't have, didn't have time to. What, the, what about the appetite for? I don't think More anyone. Importantly. Yeah, the appetite time is there. Time's fine. If you haven't got time, <clears> but what about the but appetite? Well, well, Did you want to write the, the point? The point I'm making is that <clears throat> because there've been so many games, not just Premier League, but so many league, league, um, football league games, nobody's had time. So nobody's had time to even think about it. We've gone straight from. I think it's one, one too many round of games over Christmas. If we took one of those round of games away, we'd create more time to actually think about the FA Cup, never mind just cover the FA Cup. But we've gone straight from those round of games, straight into the third round. And nobody's had time to really reflect upon that. And that's, and that's, that's also reflected in the teams. They, they, can't, they can't put out their strongest team, not just in the Premier League. We're going down, going down the leagues. You look at teams that are going for promotion. They're making more changes than the Premier League teams. I think there's a very simple solution, in my mind. You take away the two-legged EFL Cup semi-finals. You create one more midweek round of fixtures because of that. And you, and you give more time, devote more time in the run-up to the FA Cup third round. And suddenly, people are talking about the FA Cup much more because you're coming out of these round of fixtures of the Premier League with the EFL and we're straight into the, 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 uh, the FA Cup. It's just straight into it. There's, there's just no time to reflect. I say, I've not written about it because I've not had time to write mm. about it. And nobody's had time to think about it. And the teams haven't had time to prepare for it. And even nowadays, when the third round draw is made, years ago, we'd all go through the third round draw thinking, what, what, what nice features can we do? What nice pieces can we do? Because there's so many games over Christmas. We're so busy. And, so, and everyone's, everyone's attention is on, on the league games that we've got no time to think about the FA Cup. Yeah. Even, I would say, Darren, even 10 years ago, 
I can remember being in interviews with overseas footballers and when they started talking about, oh, the whole family used to sit down, mm -hmm. watch the FA Cup, it was a Dutch footballer, Belgian footballer, <coughs> Dane, whoever, whichever country they came from, they always trotted out the same line. And even then I started to get weary and tired of well, the whole family on FA Cup final, they used to sit around the television and wish mm -hmm. we could play it when we said, mm -hmm. it's changed. It has Football's changed. changed, the tournament's changed. It's my, it, we're in a modern progressive society. The history's great and the, the nostalgia's great and we need to, we need to remember that, and that's fine. It's part of the competition's rich tapestry. But what's next for it? Yeah, it's a really good point because I think as far as the stories are concerned, they are still there. You mentioned Tranmere, you mentioned Sheffield Wednesday, uh, and the young goal scorer Osazi, um, who, you know, he was playing non-league football and, and was given a chance and, and gets into the competition and scores the winner. And, you know, th there are so many good stories that you've gone through even this morning. But then if you look at the bigger picture, as far as the FA Cup is concerned, it doesn't take priority for many clubs up and down the league. And Darren, did you, at any point yesterday, did you say wow about any of the results you just no, mentioned? Not a single one. Not, not a single one. No. Well, I, my eyebrows I, I, raised at that, but, but then you, know, you look at Watford, and Watford's form has been up and down anyway. I know recently they've doing, been doing better in the Premier League, but I think as, uh, that was just an eyebrow raise rather than a real shock, mm. uh, because there wasn't a real shock yesterday. Not one shock. Not for me. Rochdale, Newcastle. Uh, nice story. <clears throat> yeah, Alan Wilbraham. I actually thought that was where the shock was going to be. I was more shocked that Rochdale, Rochdale didn't win. And I don't mean that um, in sort of to disparage Newcastle. I just thought that was the one with the ingredient with the the early kick off, the, the stadium full. You'll, you'll come off air to a text message from Luke Edwards, <laughs> Jason's <laughs> colleague of the Telegraph, be furious with you over that. No, but I just, I just thought. Um, I don't know whether I'm, I'm a lone voice here or not, but I, I still I still love the FA Cup. I, I really do, and um, I think the, the the FA haven't helped it over the years by the, the semi-finals being at Wembley. They should they should scrap that now mm. because there's just the semi-finals used to be used to be one of the the, the biggest weekends in, in in the calendar, along with the third round. And as soon as they moved the semi-finals to Wembley, it diluted what it meant to actually be at Wembley. Mm. They could they could rectify that immediately and go back to using club club grounds. I think that that would improve it. I think they could. But why why would it improve it? Because it's oh let's go to Villa Park. Well, everyone's been to Villa. It's not like oh we're going to uh, Villa, Villa, a Villa, you've Villa, never been to Villa Park for, a, for an FA Cup semi-final is incredible. Villa Park at any time. I can you? tell you, yeah, I can tell you, it's definitely it incredible. incredible. Yeah, no, I bet it you might can. Be incredible, guys. But the, the bottom line is, as you say, that Wembley should be for the final. Full stop. Doesn't matter yeah. how many times you go to Villa Park. Doesn't matter how many times you go to Old Trafford or wherever else. Wembley should but, be a place but, but for finals. The use of Wembley isn't why people are less interested in the FA Cup. Or no, it's, it's, it's a, a bigger, big, it's, that's no, a, yeah. it's one issue. There's, yeah, there's it's, so, it's, we're talking about the third round, for example. Yeah. And there's well, an issue well, around whether or not people are interested in the third round. And, well, well, what about if they moved the moved it a week later in yeah, the that's calendar? What, that's what I'm saying. So we had a, we had a, we had a clear week this this week um, to to concentrate on everything, really, really, really ramp it up rather than have it rather than have it on that first Saturday after uh, in January, move it back one week. I think if you got a greater financial incentive in the FA Cup, then maybe certainly teams outside of the Premier League would take more of an interest because, as Jason says, even the teams outside of the Premier League are making changes. Arsenal play Leeds tomorrow night. We don't know what sort of side Leeds are going to put out. There are lots of teams in the Championship, Leeds 1 and 2, pushing for promotion, trying to save themselves to stay in their respective divisions. And when it comes to the FA Cup, you show the picture there of empty stadia elsewhere in the football pyramid. And this is the problem, that clubs have other priorities other than the FA Cup. Uh, you know, there, there is an awful lot of negativity about it, um, but I think it's 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 wrong to think it's 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 universal negativity. Because uh, when I was driving down last night and listening to some of the fans who were, who were ringing into the, um, the 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 talk talk shows on um, on, on radio, there was Tramia fans who'd made big journeys to get mm -hmm. to to Vicarage Road. That could be the highlight of their season. The poor Vale fans who've gone to eight thousand uh, of them. Yeah, and you know what a day out that they've had. 
you know, and what a, what a story that was with um, Tom with, Pope. With, with Tom Pope scoring the goals. You know, the, there are we, we shouldn't be we shouldn't have this absolute downer on it that, that you know it, that it's it's miserable. I hate the fact that that, that Dean Smith has, has said it's not on his list of priorities. Now I, I can understand the pressures of wanting to stay in the Premier League, but if you if you gave an Aston Villa fan the um, the option of winning winning the FA Cup or finishing nineteenth. What, what, what are you going to pick? I, I, surely, surely you'd pick winning the FA Cup. Because they're never going to. Well, in, well, in, in, in 10 years' time, no, they're not going to say, oh, do you remember that year we finished 19th? Okay. Wasn't where, that brilliant? Well, Dom, where, where are Wigan now? Look what happened to well, them. Won well, the FA Cup. Yeah, and I tell you. What, yeah, and I, I bet you, every, if you asked every single Wigan fan. Where they, they would rather be right now? 100% they'd have that. 100%? 100% they would have the FA Cup. 100%. I disagree. I, disagree I, I don't. I, well, I, I think Wigan and Villa are very different as well. I mean, Villa are a big club, I and mean, they need to be in the Premier League. I think there are real clear reasons why they need to stay in the Premier League financially. I mean, it, it's, well, without being too sort of hard on them, if they go down, they're going to be in a world of trouble. So they need to stay up. Wigan's a slightly different scenario completely, because, I mean, there was an anomaly they were in the Premier League in the first place, wasn't is, it, is, really? OK, there's just something you just said there, that they need to be in the Premier League yeah. for financial reasons. Yeah, they do. That is the that's the problem right there, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, for a lot they of clubs. Are, yeah. If they yeah, if your club has put itself in a position where you have to be in the Premier, we you, you can't budget to be. You should budget for relegation. Well, you'd be better off budgeting well, for rele- they in are. case it happens. Yeah, I, I hope they are budgeting for relegation. But I think the, the the reality is they need to stay up. I think they they will have a lot of problems if they go down. I think obviously they were mm. they were pushing it in, in the Championship, mm. weren't they, in terms mm. of the financial mm. fair play? So I think they're going to have real problems if they do go down. I, that's, that's the reality. You're right. You're right. I agree with you. They should be budgeting, and I hope they are budgeting. But and I don't just mean that for Villa. I mean every no, no, club exactly. Yeah. Just say, I hope less. Let's but you talk to clubs and they say we, we, we can't afford to go down. You know, they cannot afford to yeah. go down. I, I understand the, the, the financial point of view. And I'm not I, agreeing I, with it, yeah, I'm just saying yeah, that's the reality yeah, of it. But I just, uh, have, we lost, uh, have we lost the sort of um, ability to, to dream and whatever? I mean, I just, you know, you make the point about Wigan. That's the greatest day in Wigan's history. If Bournemouth won the FA Cup, that's the greatest day in mm. Bournemouth's, Bournemouth's history. What is wrong with having, having these dreams? And, Aspirations, I don't understand. Dean Smith, if Dean Smith wins the FA Cup, they build a statue for him, don't they? He's, he's, he's gone down in he's, he's gone down in club football. Not if they get relegated. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, people 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 <coughs> people were saying that Villa were going to have a very hard job of staying in the Premier League when when they came up. They, they were, you know, when we do your predictions at the beginning of the season, everybody's saying, well, you know, if they can mm. finish 17th, 18th, they've done brilliantly. Winning the FA Cup would be incredible for them. Mm. The, the fan base that they've got, mm. and the history mm. that they've got as a club, that's what, that's what Aston Villa is all I totally about. I agree isn't it? that there has to be room for romance in football. Um, but I think in the, us as journalists, we have to adequately reflect the picture as it stands yeah. at the moment. And I think Jonathan Liu is reflecting the picture as it stands at the moment. We are reporting, Adrian can yeah. jump has done that story for. Yeah. The point he says, just to read you, um, it's, an, it's an interesting decision in itself to go to Birmingham against Blackburn yesterday, um, lunchtime kickoff, and he said the game's moved to lunchtime, presumably um, for overseas television. You could scarcely concoct a less romantic set of circumstances if you tried. But I would say this is just one, fi- this is just one fixture. In isolation, yes, this is a championship. This is a championship match being played in a knockout scenario. Yeah, that but happens, there are other that would matches happen, that, that we, happened when the UEFA Cup was in its heyday. I mean, we had there were games like that where people didn't necessarily go. I mean, that, that is one. I agree with you that there were a whole bunch of other fixtures yesterday which were mm. more attractive. We're, we're obviously, we talk about Rochdale and Newcastle. That was a good cup tie. It was a great cup tie. Mm. You know, obviously, Tr- Tranmere Watford is mm. a good, great mm. cup tie. I, I think the, 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 pro- the problem is just the, the overall level of interest is. Because the Premier League is so big and so successful, that is our focus. The EFL has become our focus as well. Not just in terms of journalists, but obviously in terms of the public. Mm. And the clubs, obviously, they've started it. They, they've made the leagues more and, more and more important, the money and everything else. I think we just haven't created time in, in our calendar, haven't created time in our head, mm. almost, to, to talk mm. about the FA Cup. And that's the problem. That not is only, the problem. Not only that, Jason. We have this conversation every year. You have this conversation every year. When, you get, when your guests are around the table, how can we save the FA Cup? No one listens to us. <laughs> that's why, that's the problem. Let's see if they start listening. We'll we talk talk about getting, we've talked about getting rid of replays, and they've started to do that, haven't they? Even though they've got the anomaly of having them for the third and fourth Jason, rounds. they need to yeah. make it quicker. It's 2020 yes. cricket, it's yeah. fast, it's fun, it's family oriented. It's, that's, that's so you take Rushton on Newcastle yesterday. Obviously, 
the one, 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 one draw, it goes to St James's Park, good payday for Rochdale. Wouldn't it be better to say, right, we're going to give a massive financial incentive to Rochdale to win that tie yeah. it, on penalties or whatever to get through? If you say to that, that's the trade off. Or you get the draw and you get a bonus for getting the draw yeah. in 90 minutes or mm. something. You know, that, to financially recompense them because they'll say, we're missing out on a big payday, but not going to St James's Park. But best one in the world, nobody's going to St James's Park thinking, oh, Rochdale can win, it's going to be great. Wouldn't it be great if they finished it yesterday? I don't know. I was going. I was. I was thinking about this on the way down last night, purely because you. Yes, you think ahead. I like. Yeah. No, at first. no. I was thinking about it purely because it's never you, happened you before. Pint of Guinness for it. <laughs> um, we we were at Plymouth Liverpool a couple of years ago after they'd drawn nil yes, nil at Anfield, we and what a great night that was for the Plymouth fans and the atmosphere that they created, and it was you know it was a very very close match. I don't think you should be denying fans the opportunity to see. Uh, a Premier League right, team. So another, there's another way of looking at it. What, an idea that Mourinho came up with many, many years ago when he first came to England. First mention of Plymouth ever on this programme. <laughs> uh, what does that say? Well, We're well travelled. <laughs> and I haven't forgotten that you owe me a pint of Guinness. <laughs> if Mourinho said many years ago, the lower, the lower team should always play at home. He said you should you should flip it. So if it's if it's Plymouth Liverpool, mm. if you've been drawn Liverpool Plymouth, they should play at, at Plymouth. Mm. And the, arg the argument against that is obviously you're denying fans a, a chance to go to a big stadium and obviously the financial payday for the club. So again, if you recompense the club by saying, okay, you've got the, you, you've got that draw, we will pay you more money for taking that game because there is more money in the game. Yeah, mm. they can afford that. And as you say, you, you get the big you get, you get the big game yeah. at Plymouth. That's, the only problem is you've got. You then have to play, you know, if you're Man City or Liverpool, you then have to play four away games. Third round, fourth round, fifth Heart round, leaks. quarter final. You have to play four away games. Oh well. So, it's, so it is loaded, so the draw is loaded against you from, from the outside. I like that. Well, they won't. Well, tough. They've got big squads. They can, they can mm. all cope with it. Mm. Premier League clubs can cope. Mm. Fine. Levels play. Yeah. yeah. Why, why do they flip it and say you, the, the lower league team is always at home? And then you give them extra money because of that, to recompense for not getting the. Uh, That's not a bad idea. Well, it's Mourinho, to be fair, Mourinho, he came up with it many years ago and he went down like a lead balloon. You know, not that you probably do it now, but he came up with it many, many years ago. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's. Dom. Uh, Dom doesn't have any ideas to save the FA Cup. He doesn't think there he needs to be saved. So I'm not. I'm, unless he's got something. <laughs> unless he's just come up with something. But one idea from each of you to add to the allure or the appeal or the prestige. More money. competition. Make it more lucrative. Make all about more, the cash. All about the cash. Well, you know, <laughs> listen, we were talking about this before the show started. To some of these clubs in the lower end of the, the football pyramid, the cash can buy another player. It can finance, yeah. you know, yeah. a stat. Whatever. You, you make it more financially viable for these clubs and they will buy into it. I think if it's not, if it's not worth the hassle, then we'll continue to see what we've seen before. Mm. You mentioned Fulham, all the empty seats. You mentioned lots of the other stadia around the country where the enthusiasm isn't there. I, I accept the enthusiasm mm. was there at Tranmere, you know, for the, uh, sorry, at Watford for, what, for the game against Tranmere and all the other uh, places where there were uh, eye-catching results yesterday. But essentially, the finance and the incentive to take the competition seriously just isn't there at the moment, mm. certainly not for the big clubs. So I, I think, as I say, flipping it so that not, not, not if in the same division, but if it's a lower league team, they, get, they, they, they play at home. And the other, the other idea, I think, is getting rid of the second, the, the two-legged semi-finals of the EFL Cup, and, and giving that midday, midweek fixes the Premier League, so that you aren't having so many games over Christmas and New Year, so you give people more chance to come into the FA Cup and thinking more about the FA Cup. Okay, um, that's the FA Cup uh, third round. Uh manifesto chat over for this year uh, we're going to be back in 2021 uh, with the same conversation um, okay next up we're going to talk uh, Merseyside derby it's a big game Dom's there this afternoon it's Liverpool against Everson we'll talk about it next Welcome back. Uh, Jason definitely wants to get rid of the two-legged uh, Carabao Cup <laughs> semi-finals, but he is, I should just say, going to both games, uh, <laughs> Man United, Man City. Um, you can uh, read all about uh, Jurgen Klopp and Carlo Ancelotti and their managerial history this morning. Jonathan Northcross uh, piece and the uh, contrasting styles of both managers. Of course, they are super successful uh, coaches, Carlo Ancelotti, with a rich history in the game as a manager with various clubs. Jurgen Klopp, of course, successful Borussia Dortmund and uh, Liverpool. They've got um, 
Uh, Jonathan's piece this morning, mm. Dom, says that uh, Jurgen Klopp is uh, ideological and passionate off the scale on this managerial chart. They've, they've ranked every Premier League manager here. Uh, that Carlo Ancelotti is a sort of uh, quiet, pragmatic um, type. Do you agree with this chart that they've, uh, that they've published this morning in terms of their respective styles? Is it, is it accurate? Yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. Um, I mean, I've only had very brief dealings with Carlo Ancelotti so far, but he's, he's proven to be everything that everybody said he would be, you know, very quiet, very humble, um, carries an aura about him, um, huge respect for, for what he's done, and then, you know, dealing with Klopp over the last few years, you know, he's, he is everything that you see on the touchline. Um, how, how do you, you just said Ancelotti carries an aura, how do you carry an aura? I think how has that developed, it, or, or did it, or well, was it just there from the beginning? Look, look at his, look, look at what he did as a player. Look at what he's done as a manager. The clubs that he's managed, the players that he's worked with. And he just walks into the room, and you just think, you know, you know, it's Carlo Ancelotti. If you know, if you know football, or you know, um, you know the sport, in, in any type of way, he just, he just has something about him, very sort of. Um, Humble and quiet, yeah. I mean, that that was his, his book is 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 quiet leading, quiet, quiet leadership. Quiet, quiet leadership. Yeah. That, that's him, you know. He just does everything with a smile. But uh, you know, for people who have been who've dealt with him in the club, tell me that you know that he's, you know, who's the boss. You know, he has that sort of confidence in, in in what he does. Mm. What um, what are Evertonian, what do Everton supporters expect from Ancelotti? Um, well, <laughs> and what, well, what is the expectation from the club? This is the biggest appointment Everton have ever made in terms of a manager. These, the, uh, I, I was Howard very Kendall. Come on. In in, in, the, in the last, you know, modern era. In the modern yeah, era. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an incredible coup. I was um, when it was sort of first talked about. I was sceptical about whether they could do it because there has been so much wrong behind the scenes uh, over the last four years. I mean, I remember being on this, this show a couple of years ago when they were they had to beat Watford at home in a league game. That to... wasn't your last appearance, by the way. No, no. <laughs> <I just> wanted... <laughs> no. You made it sound like that was the last no, time. No, you no. Were wrong. You've what, definitely been on since. What I'm, I'm, I'm saying is that um, there's just been turmoil and misery, and in the last few weeks. Thank goodness for what Duncan Ferguson did that day against Chelsea in terms of giving Evertonians a sense of what everything was about for the club, the fight, the lift in the atmosphere. Um, he gave them the club back that day and the fact that they then managed to get Ancelotti over the line um, speaks volumes. It shows incredible ambition. Um, I still think there's a huge amount of work to be done. Um, to get them to the places that they want to be. This squad has got players from five different managers in. Mm. It's a mishmash. They've 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 gone from so Mashiri wanted Ronald Koeman to bring stardust and presence and to the Hollywood of the Northwest as he's as he's called uh, as he's called football up, up where we're from. Um, but that didn't work. So then he wanted a, a young progressive manager in Marco Silva to get young players to work with the director of football and Marcel Brands. Now that didn't work. So he's gone completely again to another huge name, one of the, one of the biggest in, in football, to to make Everton into a, a top six team, hopefully getting into the to the top four. But they're a long, long way away from that because the transfers over the last three or four years have been awful. None of it's worked. Um, I want to say none of it. <laughs> Probably 75% of the, the dealings over the last four years haven't worked. But if, <laughs> if they can get their act together, uh, they've got somebody in an Ancelotti who will, players around the world will want to work for, mm. will want to come to. And I don't believe for one minute that Carlo Ancelotti has come to Everton without the promise of being seriously backed. But, but, I, but I, also, so I also wouldn't underestimate Ancelotti's desire to work with young players. Mm. This was a big thing at Chelsea at the time when he was there. You probably remember this, Neil, as well. I mean, obviously, he, he won the league in his first year. Second year, he started to bring in young players. Mm. 
and he finishes second, he gets he get sacked. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that's partly because he bought into the idea that then they wanted to bring in young players. So I think his desire to, to mm. do some of the things that Everton wants to do, well, people, people shouldn't think he's a checkbook manager. Mm. He's not going to no. go out there and spend loads of money for the sake of it. He's just, that's, that's not his style, to be mm. honest. I think he'd prefer to work with, with, with players and give, be given time to work with players. So I think that's the attraction for him to go to Everton. You see the way he's dealt with Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Yeah. Everyone's telling him he's got to buy a centre-forward. Yeah, yeah. What was his reaction? Well, no, I've got Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Why can't he be the centre forward I want him to be? If you're Dominic Calvert-Lewin and Carlo Ancelotti says that, says that about you, I think Calvert-Lewin himself says today uh, it makes you a uh, foot, foot taller, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, um, Jamie Carragher's column yesterday, yeah. for you, he, he said that as soon as, as soon as Ancelotti says I've got a great forward here and Dominic Calvert-Lewin, everything's so right. Well, he's <laughs> <laughs> Dominic Calvert-Lewin differently, don't yeah. they? There's yeah. an argument. This is yeah. the guy who's Ronaldo and you know. Well, well this is a, there's an argument saying that Calvert-Lewin and, and Danny Ings at Southampton are two probably the two most informed strikers at the moment. Yeah. Calvert-Lewin's got five in his last seven, and the way that um, he's been playing you know, in every game. He just looks a different player. He looks a lot more authoritative. Uh, yeah, and he's and you know what? He's 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 a confident lad. He asked he asked to take the number nine shirt in the summer. That's that's what he wanted, and it's it's the biggest shirt in Everton's mm. history, number nine. And for a 22 year old lad to ask for it, it shows mm. the sort of belief that he's got. There's an why, interesting. Um, um, guys, just, is, just just mm -hmm. just one quick point it, it, actually about Ancelotti when he. It could well be that in helping Everton, he actually revives his own reputation yeah. as well, mm -hmm. because, you know, he wanted the Arsenal job, and Arsenal, they were very unsure about him, and they didn't speak to him because they felt, well, maybe he's not the same manager he was, mm -hmm. and the impact that he's now having at a club where he's never really had to go into this sort of club before. He's normally worked with higher caliber players. Johnny Norcroft makes reference to Ashley Cole in 2010 mm. responding to the Chelsea players being told to work out their own tactics ahead of the FA Cup final mm. you know, because he likes to give players their head and, and Ashley Cole saying look this is my kind of manager. Yeah that's fine when you win the FA Cup well, absolutely. because you know you lose that game and the players say well, the manager said do what you want. Well, quite. Yeah. But the, the fact is that they're higher calibre players at Chelsea than they have at Everton as you were saying, mm. you know, the mishmash of players but if he can make a success of this suddenly his standing goes up again He's sacked from uh, Napoli, bear in mind, and a lot of people say maybe his best years are behind him. We'll have to see, obviously, what happens, but the signs are good that he could actually restore his reputation. What fascinates me about this, this piece here, Jason, is the different, uh, the contrast of, of, of management. Yeah. Um, and it is worth um, picking up a copy of the Sunday Times just to have a look at the different theories about what type of managers that um, they're in the Premier League. They've got all 20 of them, and they say that Klopp is off the scale, ide ideological and passionate, the two of the most um, important elements or crucial elements of his uh, sort of personality and his makeup. Ancelotti at the other end of the scale, pragmatic and a quiet mm. man. Yeah, I don't but, agree but, with that. But, okay, that's. So tell me why in a second, but mm. why are two different managerial styles, two very obviously different managerial styles, I think we would say, Yeah. why can they both be so successful though? The th first thing I'd say is I think there's a, third, there's a third style as well, which is the pragmatic style. I, I don't think Ancelotti, I think, I think what Ancelotti and Klopp have got in common is an emotional intelligence, and I think that's the big thing in football nowadays. You have to have an emotional intelligence to deal with players. But there are different ways to, to manage, as, it's any, as in any business, any work, walk of life. We've all had different bosses, different styles of management. Some we like more than others, some, but some are, some are as successful as others. You know, it doesn't always work. There's not just one style that works. The one style that does really work over the longer term is to have that emotional intelligence to deal with people on a human level. I think some managers still deal with players as if they're pieces of meat. I think that still happens sometimes. I think you can see that in some of their approaches. That's a very short-term approach. I think football has moved on from that approach. I think really you need, you need to get buy-in from the players nowadays, and we see that with England with Gareth Southgate. Mm. It's about it's like the buy-in. You, you've got to convince people. Can, people criticise young players nowadays, saying, "Oh, they're pampered." They're this, that. No, they're not. They're not actually. They are. Yes, they are pampered to a degree, but they're actually more emotionally intelligent. Mm. They know what they want, mm. and there's nothing wrong with knowing what you want. As mm. any young person in life, if you know what you want then fair enough, it's not for older people to tell them what they want. You've got, as an older person, as a manager, you've got to get them to buy into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if they buy into what you're doing, if anyone buys into what you're doing in any walk of life, they will be with you on that journey for longer. Mm -hmm. And that's what something like Jurgen Klopp does. And to be fair to Ancelotti, that's why I slightly disagree with the piece, I think that's what he does as well. Mm -hmm. It's just a different approach. And I think there's a third approach, which is a far more pragmatic, my way, the highway, I'm the boss, you do as I say, which can work, work in the short term, and I would say there are people who maybe a little bit more that's the Mourinho type of approach nowadays. 
that works, it works in the short term, mm. but the longer term, I'm not <coughs> sure it's sustainable. I don't think Jose will be too happy with where he is on this chart because I, well, he'd be, he probably won't want to be in the pragmatic area, will he? Because that's how he is perceived. But that's uh, where he is. is. Where he's been, but he's not on this list, is he? He's more passionate. He's, he's off the scale. Mm. Passionate. I say I disagree with that. I think yes, he has got that passionate approach, but I think he's fundamentally underpinned by a very pragmatic approach. And I think that's what comes across most of all with him. Mm. What kind of manager are you, Darren? What kind of manager would you be? I think I'd be quiet. There's nobody on this little quiet section here. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he's had a bit of stick from uh, Robin Van Persie. Quite interesting, actually. He used the word medieval the other day, didn't he? Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, you're right. I, I think you do need Bayern, and maybe he is of that ilk that he, he doesn't want to be seen to be ranting and raving in public and be about his players. He wants to be able to deal with the problems in-house and uh, publicly he wants to be able to exude an air of calm mm -hmm. and, and that's been ex uh, interpreted as weakness by some of the older school players uh, where it doesn't necessarily need to be. Yeah. What about some of the others on the, on the list? I mean, you've, just, you, you've got it in front of you as well but um, Brendan Rodgers on the sort of ideological but on the quiet side, Potter at Brighton, Eddie Howe, Bournemouth, Hassan Hootel at um, Southampton too. Yeah, are we talking about quiet in terms of how the, 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 the demeanour on the um, on, on the touchline or yeah. what in terms of in, in terms of being reserved? Yeah, I, th I think it's. Well, which one are you first? Of all? Me, uh, well, I like uh, Head and Ajax under eleven likes to play a, a passing game, so I have myself in the ideo ideological camp. It's, it's always better when you do it about some, when someone asks you. What I think you right. Oh. <laughs> where have you got? You put me down, didn't you? You wrote me on that list. I don't I know why you think I'm going to be a football manager. I don't know what. Passionate, 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 and passionate and pragmatic. Yeah, yeah, you're very pa passionate. Yeah. Very passionate leader here. Passionate <laughs> feel leader. Strongly. And where pragmatic or ideological? Pragmatic. Ideolo no, get me. I don't want to be ideolo ideological. Let's talk Liverpool um, and uh, the ideology at uh, Anfield at the moment because this man Jurgen Klopp can do no wrong. At the moment, what's his secret? Uh, I think. Uh, listen, Klopp's obviously the driving force of, of everything, um, but I think it's also reflective of what Liverpool are doing at the minute now that everything behind the scenes is going well. So Michael Edwards, the sporting director, the relationship they, those two have got is key. Um, Mike Gordon, who's the um, president of Fenway Sports Group, the the leadership that he instills from from within, um, and the players, the the play, they've got probably the best squad of players that they've had. 30, what I, 35 you know, what years. Like it, what I what I admire here is it. Tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the normally in these situations, when there is success, that other people want a little bit of credit because obviously this man is on the touchline getting all the credit, Jurgen Klopp. But in the, often, other people want a little piece of the pie and a little bit of credit. But I sense that these guys are operating without ego. Yeah, well, the, 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 the two men that I've just mentioned won't do interviews, won't, won't speak to the media, hate, hate sort of the idea that they would be front and centre of everything. Um, they're quite happy to be, to be doing their business. You know, the, the scouting department, Dave Fellows, Barry Hunter, people like that, they're quite happy to be um, in the background working away, um, identifying the next sorts of players that are going to strengthen. But they've just been very smart. They've got uh, the squad now is all on, on contracts until the, the run uh, comparison with Klopp's until 23, 23 24. Um, they're just they've got everything right and it's it's it, it's all clicked together mm, it has all clicked together it just quickly down if you're looking at liverpool at the top of the table and saying okay got to got to find a way to overcome them next season got to find a way to challenge for the league title what do the top teams do they have to hope maybe that they get consumed um, by what they've done already because i don't think that the attitude is going to change at all i think the leadership as, uh, sorry, the attitude reflects the leadership of the club and Klopp is a driven, intense, hungry manager who has transmitted all of those qualities to his players and their performances on the pitch. The most significant thing about their performances recently has been the clean sheets, five in a row. Uh, now, at the start of the season, they mm. were playing well, scoring goals, yeah. winning games, but there was still that, that defensive chink in their armour mm. early in the season. Now there isn't. And there was this belief that maybe going out to Qatar would have that... Uh, have an impact on their performances in the Premier League. He's played strong sides, at least one matches with the minimum of fuss, and I think they're only going to get better because of all of those things you say. Mm. The smart recruitment 
that, that the way that they don't shout about what they're going to do, they just quietly go ahead and do it. And I think as far as Liverpool are concerned, next season, I would imagine they would get even stronger than they are now. Yeah, OK. Um, Premier League, beware. Um, OK, next up, uh, we're going to talk uh, Jason's favourite subject. It's the uh, two-legged <laughs> League Cup semi-finals. Welcome back with us this morning, Jason Burt, Darren Lewis and Dominic King. Let's just remind you what's in the papers this morning. Uh, the Mail on Sunday, we talked about this in part one um, of the programme. Uh, the Cup has lost its sparkle. This is inspired uh, by Dean Smith, beaten Aston Villa manager. Yes, they lost at Fulham. Um, they were beaten by that Harry Arter goal, which is the back page um, of the Express uh, this morning. There were some good stories elsewhere in the FA Cup. Uh, Will Brimovic, 40 um, and still scoring goals. Came off the bench yesterday, scored for Rochdale, the equaliser against Newcastle. Uh, Watford were three up against Tramia. They drew three all. Uh, that goes to a replay at Prenton Park. We talked about Johnny Lou, um, obviously, as you would, taking yourself off to Birmingham City, Blackburn, in the uh, FA Cup third round yesterday. The empty stand here says it all um, about that game. Back page of the Sun, the January. Eight games in 25 days for jaded Manchester United. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer side drew nil-nil at Wolves yesterday. Of course, they'll now replay at Old Trafford. Back of the Sunday people. Uh, clause out for Moyes. David Moyes has got a clause in his contract uh, that West Ham can terminate at the end of uh, the season. Uh, but a big story here, Jesse Lingard and £45 million for James Madison. That's Steve Bates' story this morning. Um, in the people. And Everton left reeling by record losses. That's because they keep sacking their managers. This is Tom Morgan's story. Uh, their financial results uh, will be later this week. And we've just been talking about uh, these two men. And they go head to head uh, this afternoon Jurgen Klopp and Carlo Ancelotti. OK, let's move on though, Jason, to those two legged, um, <coughs> sorry to stress the two legged, um, yeah. semi finals, League Cup semi finals this week. Of course, Leicester City and Aston Villa. But first up on Tuesday night is Manchester United and Manchester City. Um, Pep loves it. He's in love with this competition, in the, almost in the same way as Jose Mourinho uh, when he first took over at Chelsea. Um, it was the first trophy um, that he won, of course, beating Liverpool at the Millennium Stadium. He came back to win it too um, in his second spell yeah. in, in charge. Also won it with Manchester United. But um, who does this, this match over the two legs, who will it mean more to? It's a good question because you'd, just, you'd, you'd obviously just say Manchester United, but actually because um, Manchester City pre won't win the league, they're, they're going to try and win everything else, aren't they? So the League Cup does matter to them. I, mean, it's a, I know it's, it's the most junior competition they're left in, but actually to lose the League Cup semi-final to Manchester United is going to be quite a big blow to them if they go out of this competition. The, mm -hmm. I'm sure Guardiola will want to turn around and win everything else that's available to him because, let's say, the Premier League is very unlikely. But then at Manchester United, if they lose to Manchester City, you know, it's it's a bad look for Solskjaer because you know it's a, it's a competition that they again could possibly win. It's going to go away from them. So I think it means an awful lot to both of them. I think if you're going to say who does it mean the most to, it probably means the most to Solskjaer, but not by an awful lot. Probably not by as much as you would think because, as I say, you know, City have to have to win trophies, you know, and they're not going to win the league. You, you talked about, uh, or we we talked on this table this morning about fixture congestion, and I've always thought, okay, so if you're successful, you. will the, the price you pay for success is you will have to play, there will be a backlog of fixtures. That backlog of fixtures is normally in April, May time. Mm. Well, I haven't got Manchester United's schedule for the end of December, uh, but what I do have in front of me is Manchester United's schedule in January. Where they will play eight games in 25 days mm. in January across different cup, cup comp, Premier League, obviously, League Cup two-legged semi-final, plus the Wolves replay. Mm. That is their schedule. For January, January, mm. but you expect them to get, but, ex but the expectation, of course, and the demands are that Manchester United win those matches. Of course, it is. They're Manchester United. They're one of the biggest but this could clubs be any, in the sorry, world. Sorry, this is the example of Manchester United. This could be another. Could be another team. I just think the red demands are unrealistic. I do. Think, that's the point I, I'm making. I do agree Not with Manchester that. Manchester United point. could be any team. And the one consistency over the Christmas period is that you had Jose Mourinho. Uh, Klopp, Guardiola, all saying similar mm. things. You know, the demands on these players is too great. Uh, Jose Mourinho was saying, you know, by any law of physics, science, whatever. Um, in a, uh, I think it was a press conference after the Brighton game at home, and he was uh, uh, he was saying it's ridiculous the pressure that you are putting on these footballers. And we've seen clubs lose players. Aston Villa lose their goalkeeper and their striker. Harry Kane is out now injured for two months. You know, and you don't are, think it's a coincidence? 
No, 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 no of course no, not. No, absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. And I think the managers are all right. I mean, look, I started off by saying that it's hard to have sympathy for top clubs who have big squads, expensively assembled squads. But at this, by the same token, it is easy to have sympathy when you look at that fixture list and see that demands that are being placed on those players. Because it's one thing having good players, it's another thing flogging the life out of those players over a sustained period of time, which is exactly what's happening, not just with the big clubs, but with the smaller clubs as well. So I do have a lot of sympathy as far as that's concerned. Mm. It's a point Jurgen Klopp um, reiterates. It's a, it's a, it's a yeah. regular thing. For he's, him. he's been talking about it. He, he first raised it um, this season when we were on pre-season tour in um, Indiana. And he, he was he was making the point about Sadio Mane, and he looked he was looking further ahead. And uh, there's another Copper America next summer, isn't there? There's the it's the year that the the, the Copper America is back to back. Um, and he was you know he was he was explaining the demands, and then people look at it. Oh, Klopp's moaning again, and he's, and he's reiterated the point. He is not doing it for Liverpool. He is making the point for. Players as a whole, he, he said it on, on on Friday about Newcastle. Newcastle losing four players in one match mm. through through injuries. That it, it is, it, it can't be a coincidence. It just, it can't be. No. I mean, I, I totally agree. The only thing I would say is the Premier League clubs. It's their league. It's not that the Premier League is a, is a company that runs the Premier League matches, runs the Premier League. But it's the, cl the clubs are 20 shareholders in the Premier League. They can go to the Premier League and instead of keep saying, we want more money, we want more money, we want more money, it's actually say, we want a better calendar. Mm. They, they can turn around and say, we'll take a bit less money next time round if you organise the calendar that works for us a bit better. Now, obviously, it gets more complicated when you're talking about UEFA and FIFA and yeah. everything else, you talk about international players, it's much more difficult. But I don't have any sympathy for the clubs when they, keep, when they start complaining about players getting, being tired, fixture congestion, because I know the demands they put on the Premier League to get more money. We had two or three chief executives of the Premier League who turned down the job because they know it's impossible to get more money out of the broadcasters because the broadcasters can only go so far because they, you know, they, they obviously if they're going to pay all this money, they want to show the games. So therefore the games have to be staggered or changed. Or if be, people say, well, no, no more three, three o'clock kickoffs. Yeah, because people want more, more, more and more money. If they, ask for, if they actually accepted a little bit less money, mm -hmm. then we could look after the players better. And that means the players accepting a little <coughs> less, less money in the wages as well. Would, would, we we see a pro would we see a better product if... A manager had five or six days to clear of his schedule to prepare his players for a game. Yes, we would, because the players would be fresh. You think the quality be... of the football would be better? The standard would be better. Well, yeah, because listen, you'd see fewer squad players because the top players would have time to rest. The teams would be fresher. Mm -hmm. The performances would be better. You'd have more consistency in the results as well. The fact is that we all want, although we all want to be entertained, we all want to ensure that the best players get the, you know, enough rest to be able Darren, to perform on a regular basis. what we all week waiting? <coughs> Monday, <coughs> let's say we watched a game on a Saturday afternoon at mm. 3 o'clock, traditional 3 o'clock, and had to wait a week we were for, talking for, about this. for another kick-off. We were what talking about this before the, the we'd show all be started. Part, we'd all be in part-time part part jobs. Be Go I was going to say, we'd be creative. Sort of things to do, isn't it? We read a book. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven forbid. You know. No, there's a balance, isn't there? Yeah. There's a balance. You're not talking yeah. about giving them a whole week off or you know, only one game a week or something, but there's a balance to be struck. When they've got games on every single day, so many games every day, and it's all staggered throughout the week, that's when it becomes a problem and you're you mixing and matching so much. I mean, the, the, issue, I say, the issue is because they're just asking for more and more money from the broadcasters. Mm, wasn't, wasn't and it's the greed of the Premier League clubs. Mm. They want more money. Do the, that's do the journalists get... That's what I want to know. Do we don't get a pro rata. The journalists, no. the journalists, I mean, how many games... How many <clears> games <throat> there was one... 2012-13, I think, I, including... Uh, including, I will say this, going to, going to watch my own team pretty much home and away yeah. for 40-odd games. We were up to about 100... It was about 170 games throughout the course of the season. You did 170? It was, but wow. not all of them professionally. Yeah. 40 of them were just going to watch Man's team on a Saturday art. It was almost... At, yes. Yeah. Almost <laughs> I, I can contest that figure because I was working with them back then, so it would be easy <laughs> to go through the curtains. Yeah. No, I reckon I would do... I'd do about 110, I think, in a season, which yeah, seems... Yeah, so if you added, like, if you added on... Yeah. You know, Abingdon United or whatever, yeah, you know, yeah. another 40 games there. So yeah. you're up to 150 games already, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't there a, a, but 110 it, games, and, you know, Jürgen only has to deal with 60 or 70. I know, I know. But what, I was man. just going to say, wasn't there, it wasn't there, um, Look how good he looks for it. <laughs> wasn't there a tidbit in um, um, Martin Ziegler's 
diary yesterday about um, it being on the not one of the chief executives has made any sort of um, mm. suggestions to, the, to put it on the minutes for the next Premier League yeah. meeting mm. that's coming up. Nobody's said anything about the fixes. But, but, but I know for a fact that some of the people who turned down the job to come CEO of Premier League have done so because they know that the pressure is just to get more money out of the broadcasters. And that's mm. what. You, there's only so much you can do with mm. the calendar. There's just so much you can do. And they're stretching it and stretching it. And they're, they're manipulating ways of getting more games in and how they can get stretched. You know, obviously, different people coming into the market now and the you know, games every day. They've got, to, they've got to step back and think, look, come on, we, we reached saturation point. That's mm. it. We've got to think about the welfare of the players and the product that we're mm. producing and think, actually, maybe we need to accept a little bit less money next time round and think of other ways of making the money, not just about out of the broadcast deals. Mm -hmm. OK, um, let's move on because these, these two teams are in um, the Carabao Cup semi-finals. They're not playing each other, but a uh, big transfer story, this one, from Steve Bates. <clears throat> Back of the Sunday Mirror. Um, uh, and it's about Jesse Lingard, uh, James Madison, that to Manchester United, the intro is Manchester United are ready to trade Jesse Lingard in exchange <coughs> for James Madison um, and £45 million pounds, um, to tempt Leicester into selling him. Is this a deal? Does this look like a good deal from the outside? For no. all concerned? No. No. Uh, Who loses out? It's not a great deal. Leicester lose out. Leicester lose out on a wonderful player. And Brendan Rodgers has already said that he doesn't have to, he will not sell any player that he doesn't have to sell. He won't, I don't think he'll be leaving at all. Uh, and I think uh, Brendan's building a special team. And especially, I don't want to say project, but a special team and a special ethos at the club that you would imagine he wants to be part of. No player, I don't know if we're still in that era where it's hard to turn down Manchester United, but certainly as far as Madison is concerned, he's on an upward trajectory and his performances are consistent. We all know what we think of James Madison uh, for England as well as uh, for Leicester. And it's interesting to see why United would want him, but I still think he's got a lot to offer Leicester, and I don't think that Rodgers would sell him. And we saw with Mahrez as well when City came knocking, they held on Leicester until they were ready to sell, rather than that. Even though the player got upset, down tools, whatever else, Leicester st stood firm financially. They're strong enough to be able to do that. We're a long way away from the days when United would come along and clubs would go weak <coughs> at the knees. They are strong enough to and hold on. They did it in the summer with Harry Maguire, I don't forget. Yeah. And they got absolutely what they wanted for him, didn't they? Yeah. And they got it, they, and they sold him when they were ready to sell him. Mm. It wasn't like Manchester United came calling, they panicked and sold the player. Yeah. They, they, they got their money for him. And I think that's the problem with this deal. If, if Manchester United are putting this bid in for, for Madison in January, good luck with that. I don't see. It. I don't genuinely don't see it happening. I may no, literally no, regret no saying that, but I don't right. see it happening in January. It may happen in the summer, but again, in the summer, it will be on Leicester's terms mm. because Leicester have proven, as Darren says, over the years, the last few years, that they will sell on their terms. They're, they're prepared to sell, which is fine, mm. but they will sell on their terms. They're not going to be bullied into selling by a, 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 a no. so-called bigger club. I think 45 million undervalues Madison as well. Massively. Plus Lingard. Yeah. What, what would you say? What, what would, if you're putting a figure on Lingard, what would you say? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think I, I, I agree so, with you. I don't see why Leicester would go go for that deal. But I, I mean, think Manchester United would value about thirty million or something. Wouldn't I, they? I would think if you if you're opening the bidding with M Madison, you're going to have to sort of go seventy, seventy-five, easy, for what he is. He's, he's what twenty-two, twenty-three in the England squad. He's had a brilliant season. Lingard twenty-seven. Can yeah. I get just just a note on Lingard. I mean, a lot of people maybe be uncomplimentary about Lingard. Ian Laderman did a piece a couple of weeks ago, yeah. a terrific piece, yeah. where he mm -hmm. talked about the issues that Lingard's is dealing with yeah. and has had to deal with, and I think they've affected his form. So you're not really looking at the no, player I'm, I'm not, uh, he is at his peak. I, I, wouldn't, his I wouldn't be disparaging of Jesse Lingard. I think, mm -hmm. he's a, uh, I think he's been a very, very good player for Manchester United, and I love the fact that he is at Manchester United because he, he knows the club. He's, He's, he's a symbol of you know their academy and he gets it and identifies with the fans. I'm not saying anything about him, I'm just sort of talking about respect of market values at the minute and 45 million Lingard, I don't think Leicester would, would, would go anywhere near. No, it's not enough. Um, OK, what will happen in the uh, semi-finals this week? So, of course, we've got Manchester United, Man City um, on Tuesday nights and then, of course, uh, Leicester against Aston Villa. Uh, first legs on, uh, on Wednesday. I think it'll. I think it'll be. Uh, I think what well, the interesting will be it, is Manchester United. What, what, what tactics will they approach mm -hmm. the game with? Because obviously we saw them win at the Etihad and win well. They, mm -hmm. they play ex exceptionally well. They can't necessarily take that approach on Tuesday. Although I think their fans will accept them not having the ball as much. But I think it's going to be quite difficult for them to manage that over two legs. 
And I think that's why Manchester City will be the favourites to go through over two legs. I can see them getting some sort of result on mm. Tuesday, but I think City will probably go through over two legs. Yeah. United raised their game a lot against the top six sides this season. They have done. But against Arsenal, they were poor. Um, now, could, would that be because Arteta has come along and he's obviously made them a much more robust and consistent side? I know you're going to talk about them in a sec, but I think as far as United are concerned, it's which United turns up against City because they're becoming a team you can't really trust True. at the moment. And, you know, you don't know which United will turn up from one game to the next. If the United that did so well against City and Liverpool and the other teams turns up, then I think Oli could could win it and I think if Oli ends up with a trophy this season even if he doesn't finish outside the top six that will actually justify the faith they've got in him because I think his statistics are, 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 are less favourable than his predecessors mm -hmm. since Sir Alex retired and yet they're giving him the most that they're indulging him they've really yeah. really got a lot they've, they have got behind him yeah. but I think as, if, if he can get a result against United uh, against City I think it will stand him in good stead I think he yeah. needs it more absolutely okay yeah, big week uh, Ahead in Manchester, that's for sure. OK, uh, next up, we're going to talk uh, about Mikel Arteta and the impact that he's made at Arsenal. Of course, they play in the FA Cup tomorrow night against Leeds. Welcome back. Uh, we are going to talk uh, Arsenal Leeds in a few moments' time um, because they're playing each other in the FA Cup third round tomorrow night. So we'll talk about Arteta's impact at the Emirates. So it would be remiss of me, though, um, while we've got Jason on, uh, not to talk about his new best mate. Um, <laughs> I he's knew, elbowed, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, well, yeah, you've elbowed me out of the way, haven't you? <laughs> not heard from you in months. Actually, I did hear from you a couple yes, of weeks ago. Yes, I rang you. Which, yeah, you yeah. did, which was a very Thank kind you. and uh, very nice <laughs> gesture. Um, but you also, your phone has been red hot with Mino Raiola. Um, if only. Paul, yeah, Paul Pogba's agent. Now, you've been to see him. Uh, yeah. You sat down for a piece. What... Um, yeah, why, why Raiola and yeah. why now? Why did you? Because it's un, I say that because it's unusual. Yes. And it has been done before. It's not mm. the first time it's ever happened, but it is unusual to sit down with a football agent. Why did you decide to do it? Why did you decide to sit down with this particular agent? It's, it's, it's an interesting. It's, you're, right, you're right to ask the question. Um, basically, you know, he's somebody who fascinates me as, as a character as much as anything else. Hear so many stories about him. Uh, I won't tell you the first thing he said to me when I rang him up, but it was fairly rude. Um, quite dismissive, and I, even that I found quite intriguing. Why, why was he so rude to me yeah. the first time I spoke We've to him? We've all had but, that often, but and but, but in a quite a funny way as well. It wasn't just like kind of rude, rude. It was actually quite quite a funny way he put me down, and I was quite fascinated by that. And so I thought I want to try and get to meet him, see what he was like. Fortunately, he agreed to do it as an on-the-record interview, and, and I turned up in, in Monaco to see him, and I, I, I knew that he didn't like people being late. Um, so, so I turned up early and he was very pleased that I turned up early and when I sat down to speak to him he spoke for 32 minutes and this is not any, any exaggeration whatsoever without me asking a question he told me one story for 32 minutes and it was about lateness basically so it, it started at one point went all the way around 32 minutes later came back to the same point and then he said that's why I don't like people being late mm. and I just thought he's, quite, he's a larger than life character he's quite an interesting character never wears a suit he always wears his sweatpants and, 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 and a hoodie and I said to him well, why are you dressed like that he said because people, people underestimate you and I just think when you meet these sort of characters, some people say to me, well, why do you want to interview an agent because he's not a player or a manager, he's not that important, they're the sort of parasites of football and blah, blah. But they're important people in the game, they're important players, um, players in terms of the market. And also he's an, he's an interesting character, I just thought he'd make quite an interesting interview. And what I wanted to talk to him really was about him and how he works and how he operates and the, and the way he goes about things. And I would say he's a very engaging character, very sweary, but also very funny. And, uh, in meeting him, it was it was quite interesting. And then what was happened subsequent to that is obviously we've seen the more the stories come out about Pogba. Mm -hmm. His reaction to that was interesting because his reaction was was obviously uh, Pogba and with Erlen Haaland was was to go on the front foot. He's come on the front foot and attacked. Mm -hmm. And I think some people are like that. And obviously it's 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 basically you know you could say it's kind of like you know old-fashioned tit for tat. And maybe we shouldn't be talking to these sort of agents. But he could from his point of view he said that Manchester United are in the wrong because of this other thing. We're all journalists, we all, we all like to get information, we all like to talk to people who've got information, and he's somebody who has information, he knows what's going on in the market, he knows what's happening with various players, and I just found him quite an engaging and fascinating character. I mean, we, we crave the information, Jason, and the thing is, if someone, sit, if someone is, lights the touch yeah. paper and says, well, yeah, you can print this on the record, that's just, that's just gold. Yeah, and he, and, he, and, he was, and he was good like that. I mean, I say, I was, at the interview was almost two and a half hours. 
had 13,000 words of transcription <laughs> from him. You know, it was extraordinary, basically, how much 13, he talked. 13,000 words? 13,000 words. Two chapters of a book. I know, that's what I was Save thinking. Save that. <laughs> if he ever wants to do one in the future, I've already got half, and half written. Um, there's an awful lot of information, an awful lot of stuff in there, and distilling that down into, into an interview was quite hard work. Um, but just, yeah, as you say, he wanted to go on the record. I didn't, it was his offer to go on the record and talk. And I say, I don't think he does an awful lot of interviews. And, and I, think, I think it was an opportune time to talk to mm. somebody who is an important player in football. Okay. Whether you like it or not, mm. these agents, yeah. uh, especially a handful of them, are very important players in football. Yeah. So, what the, so what's the, when you gauge the temperature, what's going to happen? What, do, what was what's interesting? Not what's going to happen. Yeah. Tell me the reading on Pogba. What was interesting was this kind of perception that he's just in it for the money. Now, obviously, he's made an awful lot of money out of, out of the game. Obviously, an awful lot of money out of, his, out of the deals he's done with his client. Uh, what I would say, and this, and this doesn't sound, and people might roll their eyes and think, I'm just saying this because I interviewed him. He did also come across somebody who really did care about his players. I mean, really cared about his players. I mean, the way mm -hmm. he spoke about Pogba, he was very, very, very clear in the way he thought Pogba's career should develop. He wasn't sure about him going back to Manchester United in the first place. Said he wanted the player wanted to go there. He wanted to go back. He felt it was like you know he was like going back home. And he talked about how you know now he thinks that the possibly part of the problem at Manchester United isn't 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 Paul Pogba or Manchester United, isn't maybe that's not the right fit for both of them. You know, maybe why, why did they buy him in the first place? You know, mm. did they really need him? He talked about the lack of identity at Manchester United. So he's, he's gone into it quite deeply. He's not just talking about the money. And I think with Haaland as well, people say with Haaland, why didn't he go to Manchester United? Obviously, there's been briefings saying that, you know, the, the, the demands from the agent and his father were far too great. His spin on that, or his take on that, was actually, no, Borussia Dortmund is the right move for him right now. Going to Manchester United at 19, he might get lost. Mm. And there are young players who have gone to England who have found it really hard. If he goes to Dortmund, stays there two or three years, then he can go to the Premier League. Now, maybe there are financial incentives for him to say that anyway, but also there's logic in that. There's a logical argument to that. Do you and know when what, he James, talked on a different scale, because when this happened the other day, I thought, who turns down Manchester United? But then I remember, you know what, Matt Janssen, Carlisle, Sir Alex Ferguson was desperate to sign him at Manchester United, desperate, wanted him, and he said, I'm going to go to Crystal Palace first, and assuming all goes well at Crystal yeah. Palace, then he'll get, then he'll get, he ended up at Blackburn Rovers, doesn't matter okay. about the reason, that but, happens, yeah. but it does, but his strategic move, yeah. that was Janssen's strategic move, no to Manchester United at this moment in time, doesn't believe he'll get but the we, team, we, went to Palace. But also we, we talk about Jurgen Klopp. Manchester United tried to get Jurgen Klopp. Jurgen Klopp didn't go to Manchester United because he wasn't sure what they were doing. Mm. He wasn't sure about Manchester United. He wanted to go to Liverpool because he had a clearer plan that Liverpool was the right fit for him. Mm. Liverpool was the right club for him to go to at that time. He could have gone to Manchester United on mm. one or two occasions. Yeah. He decided not to do that. So sometimes, you know, people think, well, why didn't he go to Manchester United? Well, maybe for Haaland at this point in his career, it's not the right move. Well, and maybe to be fair to the agent, OK, maybe yeah. he's got a financial incentive to take a British Dortmund, although he denies that there is a clause. Maybe <coughs> he sees that as the right stepping stone for a 19-year-old kid who's only really had a season, half a season, mm. or in, in the spotlight. Mm. And does it, is it really right for him to go to Manchester United and, right now? And United are a different club now to the club that Janssen could have joined. Dortmund have got a sustained track record of developing and looking after young players and yeah. helping them to fulfil their potential. And I, listen, I, I got... Sympathy is probably not the right word, but as far as... Uh, Raiola is concerned. Uh, he's putting his best, his client's best interests at heart. If you look at somebody like Pogba, lots of people will see him as the problem, the scapegoat. But some of the, the worst performances this season have come without him in the team, and and he's not been there to pin the blame on. And I think, and you look at the the full, uh, France side, he won the World Cup with, surrounded by quality. The Juventus side, he won the league with and got to the Champions League final with, surrounded by quality. This is an average Manchester United side. We talked about the fact that you can't trust them from one game to the next. And Pogba is being blamed for many of the problems at mm -hmm. the club. And maybe he's better off out of there. And as he's been saying this week, I don't know if it was you he said it to, at the moment, you can bring any number of marquee players to Manchester United and they'd struggle yeah. because of the problems that are at the club. Mm. What, um, what will happen with, with Pogba? Solskjaer said he's not going in the January transfer window. But do you get a sense of his future, whether that's at Manchester United or is it elsewhere? It's almost getting to the the point, isn't it, where it's um, distracting for him to be there. We could, you could see Solskjaer's reaction on Friday when the when the question came in. You know, he he tries to sort of keep a level head, doesn't he? But you sort of saw the the, the flicker in him where the, oh. you know he puffed the cheeks and whatever. The longer Pogba stays. The more he's going to be, he's, he's going to be discussed. It was the, I remember with Liverpool with Suarez. It becomes a point where, no matter how good that player is, 
he can become too heavy and too sort of divisive, isn't it? Sort of dominant, isn't it? It's yeah, it, it, yeah, it's just sort of oppressive, yeah. and you have to make the clean break if you want to move on. Sure. If he doesn't want to be there, he. But Matt Snow should have sold him last summer. Yeah. They should, why, did they, why did they hold on to him? You know, they, they obviously, they wanted their valuation met, but they should have just cut, cut, done the deal and cut, cut him loose. Mm. If, that, that's a sign of strength. They, they, they saw it as a sign of strength to keep hold of him. We've mm. got, we're going to keep Paul Pogba. But if, if he's not going to be the player that they, they want him to be, or if he, they can't fit him in or whatever, then, then, then they should cut him loose and let him mm. go. Sure. OK. Normally this story, this um, programme is all about the back pages, but you've got the front there. What's going on with Jason? Not with me. Holly and Phil, I think you've been reading about that over the last couple of minutes. Darren, get Doesn't back on the back pages, trouble. man. That's what we're here for. <laughs> OK, um, next up, what are we going to talk about? Uh, Rooney's return uh, to the FA Cup. He'll be in action for Derby this afternoon at uh, Crystal Palace. I might pop along to that. Um, and uh, Christian Eriksen is on his way to Inter Milan. We'll tell you next. OK, Mikel Arteta, he's off the mark. Uh, victory over Manchester United uh, a few nights ago. Um, Jason was there. Uh, Darren was there as, as well. First mm. victory as, mm. uh, as Arsenal manager. They play, of course, Leeds United in the FA Cup tomorrow. Uh, did you see signs? What, what were the differences in the old... Uh, between the, was there a difference between the Arsenal that he inherited and the Arsenal, what, three games in? Yes, absolutely. Uh, lots of positive signs. Defensively strong, offensively aware, very sharp. Very, lots of appetite. Uh, second clean sheet in four after just one clean sheet in 15. You can see already what he's brought to the side. All the talk about him speaking to the players and saying, look, if you don't work hard for me on the pitch, I'll drop you. That seems to have got through. People criticised Meza Ozil after, well, before the performances against Chelsea and, and Bournemouth, and they didn't still believe that those performances weren't a flash in the pan. But again, he was fantastic, and the stats show that he recovered the ball more than any other player mm -hmm. on the pitch in that game last week. So it's getting through, and he's making an almost immediate impact. Did you think he would? Ex Everton, ex -Everton player, of course, someone that you'd have yeah. uh, come across and you'd have known from his time at Goodison yeah, yeah. Park. He's a deep thinker, really deep thinker, um, intelligent lad. Um, glad that he's got, he's, he's got the opportunity um, to show what he knows and he's, he's obviously had a, a great school and working with um, Pep Guardiola but um, I just find it fascinating that you know the change of manager comes in and then all of a sudden it clicks yeah, yeah. and it's back I mean, what, what, what have they been doing for the last couple of years mm. Ozil and things I, like I, I, I sometimes think because that question gets asked a lot and you were saying earlier mm. about buying mm. you know a part of a manager's job is to manage the players is to motivate the players it's not like outside in the real world if you like where if an individual doesn't work hard, you can just get rid of them and get someone mm. else in. You've got a group of players and your job is to manage them. And if that relationship breaks down, then you're culpable because man management is part of your job. You know what I thought was significant about uh, uh, Emre going? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. Um, I didn't see one sort of uh, tweet, Instagram post about thank you for working with you, which is always like kind of stock, but I didn't see anything for, for Emery which suggested that he had mm. lost the yeah, lost the, only, the only thing I'd say about that, Dom, is if I was going to say thanks to uh, a football manager for, for working well, with I'd, I'd, I'd think about picking up the phone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tweet I it. No, but a lot of people do it now for three yeah, minutes, don't they, to make it, you know. They do. Yeah, but I... Well, about the per it's not yeah, it's an impersonal oh, touch. I'm yeah. I'm all about the personal. touch. I know, but I'm just saying this is what it, it's it's a, f a trend now, isn't it? It's a, a phenomenon. I do exactly the same thing as you. You pick the phone up or say thank you. Or... Why are you looking at me? <laughs> no, I'm not looking. At you. you are. No, no, no I agree. I'm, I'm old fashioned. I, I'd rather phone somebody or text them rather than just you know tweet. I wouldn't tweet. Text them. That is old fashioned. You know. I just, um, <laughs> I, I just think Arteta, Arteta at the moment, there are a lot of doubts about it. A lot of people, um, including myself, got to say, got to be honest. But I, you know, I just think Arsenal, a huge club, still with the potential to get into a top four, still got quality there. But there's a, a lot of players that have been dismissed and written off, and you know, that's how he's going to need to go and do this and do that in the transfer market. But he's just shown what good organisation, good coaching, inspiration and motivation can do mm. you know, to a club and, and he's, he's managed to turn at least the signs are good. I know Solskjaer started particularly well so you know you can't get too carried away but yep. the signs are very good. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if we'll get time to talk about Rooney. He may play for Derby this afternoon at Palace. I can give you a match report next week. Um, but um, back of the sun here into Milan keen to sign uh, Christian Eriksen uh, this month. 27 uh, out of contract at the end of the season 
Jason. Um, is it a move that you can see happening? Well, he wants to go to Spain, so that's his ideal destination, but I don't think that's going to happen this month. Um, I think his hope was to obviously go last summer, but maybe to hang on to the end of this season and go, go in the summer if, if Real Madrid or Atletico Madrid actually did come in for him eventually, which I'm not sure they're going to, actually. Um, I think he was hoping all last summer that was going to happen, and he just didn't, did it? No. They, they didn't have an offer, did they? I don't think. Um, so it makes sense. It makes sense for him to go. It makes sense for Tottenham to get rid of him now. I think it's become too big an issue around the club. I think Mourinho wants to probably, surely wants to try and get his own people, wants to try and get some movement. If he's not going to sign a new contract, they'll lose him for free. Obviously, they've got Alderweireld signing a new deal, but they, obviously Ericsson doesn't look like he's going to sign that. So I think Tottenham, it makes an awful lot of sense for them to, to move him on, to create some space in the, in the squad to bring somebody else in. How, how do clubs... Now, I think this is quite a unique situation, Darren, and I say that because we've known for a long time now that Christian, this isn't necessarily all about the money. No. Or ambition. This is a guy who wants to play, having played for Ajax... Mm. Lived in London and played in the Premier League with Tottenham. Lived in England. Wants to play in another country while he's at the top, mm. while he's at the peak of his powers. This, to my mind, is an unusual. It's unusual for a player um, for it to be known. It's well known, isn't it, in the game that he wants to play in another mm. country yeah. to experience the lifestyle, yeah. to experience culture, to experience a different club and play at the highest level. But how does a club prepare for that? Well, it looks a little because it doesn't matter. Because the point is. No matter how much, how many times Daniel Levy asked him into his office to say, let's have another chat, let's have another chat, he said, no, I just want to play in another country. Mm, mm. I want to play in another club for another club. It's as simple as that. I think the way they've been trying to prepare for it by, is by buying Giovanni Lo Celso. He's, had, he's been injured early, um, but it looks like they're going to pursue a, a permanent deal. He's there on loan at the moment. Mourinho, after I mentioned their game against Brighton, where he was doing the press conference, and in that press conference he said to us, uh, I already know what he's going to do. And I already know that, you know, what, what his plans are for next season. So the club appear to be ready for Ericsson's departure. I think the only key thing now, as you say, is whether they let him go at the end of the season, where they get nothing, or if they try to get him out this season and they get £20 million. Into Milan, considering the clubs he wanted to go to, and he was very open last season somewhere about the fact that he wanted to go to Real Madrid, they haven't come for him. Into Milan would seem to be a step down. But there's still another culture, still another country, another experience for him, mm. and a good club as well. So it could be that he gets an experience, probably just not the one he wants. Mm. The other problem Tottenham have got at the moment they're facing, of course, not facing, um, they're having to work out what to do without Harry Kane. Mm. Yeah, it's a huge, huge, um, huge loss for them. I know I'm not, I'm not saying anything um, re revelatory there, but um, it, you know, given the predicament that they've had um, or the start of the season and the way the results have been, um, with him missing for the for the next couple of months, I would say their hopes of a top four finish are probably extinguished. Mm. Mm. Extinguished. Mm. What, what, does, what does England do? What does England do as well? Do you, like, uh, who, 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 who? you know what? What, what, what? Would Danny Ings have a have a show for the next next uh, round of matches? To, to I think see what he's done. Is a more likely option because younger, yeah. I think. Yeah, he know, but he knows Danny from he knows Danny yeah. from the twenty ones, um, and he's an absolute fire at the minute. Mm. You know, it'll, be Tammy, it'll be Tammy Abraham's chance, won't it? Though, to be fair, I mean, I think he'll be loyal yeah. to Tammy Abraham. Give yeah. him a chance if if Kane's missing for England, friend, they're friendly. Mm. I think all three of them are in with a shout. I think Danny Ings' goal the way he took it against Spurs. You know, mm. the control and the finish. That's a striker who was at the top of his game, really confident. But at the same time. Under Ancelotti, the Cavaliers a different player, you know. So, uh, it, the fact is that there are options. Obviously, he's the best option, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, but it's great to see that we've got other strikers who can throw their hat into the ring with some justification. To, to be fair to Tottenham, I mean, obviously they've coped without Kane in the past. I mean, Son did very, very well. Yeah, the yeah. problem they've got is Son did well when Ericsson was there doing well. Yeah. And if Ericsson's not going to be there, and Ericsson, or Ericsson's not going to play very much, that's, that's, they've lost. if they lose Ericsson and Kane, mm -hmm. that's going to be a real problem for them. Mm -hmm. But then they've got Ali back scoring goals. Uh, yeah. which is, you know, he hasn't been scoring goals for, on a regular basis for quite mm. some time and now he's back to being where he was. Very quick word on uh, an ex-England striker, Rooney, this afternoon. Could play against Palace in, for his new club, Derby. Yeah, um, I think this, it's, it's paving the way for his next, next phase of his career. Um, he's desperate to go into coaching. Um, I know he's been doing a lot of work to prepare for this, um, speaking to people and getting advice. Um, I wouldn't be surprised in five years' time, ten years' time, really. I can see him managing Everton Monday. Really? Back there? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I think I think that would be his. That would be the dream. Yeah, the dream for Wayne Rooney. Um, back at uh, Goodison Park. He's played there twice, of course. Uh, could be back as uh, manager, but an interesting uh, if that happens. OK, um, that's all we've got time for uh, today. Thanks very much uh, to our guests this morning. Jason on his way to Anfield this afternoon. Uh, Darren and uh, Dom, good to see you off to Anfield as well. Enjoy uh, the uh, magic of the FA Cup this afternoon. OK, uh, football coming your way this week. <coughs> Uh, Carabao Cup, it's the semi-finals, the first leg, Manchester United against Manchester City and on Wednesday, Leicester against Villa. Don't forget you can download the podcast from all the usual places, catch up with the show, it's on demand. We're back next week at 10 o'clock, we'll see you then, bye-bye. Sky Sports, feel it all.